Okay. Pardon? Good morning, everybody. Welcome to this uh, new seminar by the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía and the, the Severo Ochoa program. Oh. Um, today, we will have the talk by Dr. Miguel Dioque from uh, ALMA uh, in Santiago, Chile. Uh, and he will talk about uh, revisiting the intermediate to high mass star formation. Miguel, uh, he got the master in astrophysics and cosmology at the Universidad uh, Autonomas in, in Madrid, in Spain. Then uh, the PhD from the University of Leeds in United Kingdom in, Octo in October two, 2020 on her big A and B stars using Ga Gaia. During his uh, PhD, he spent uh, 18 months at the European Space Astronomy Center, SAC, in Madrid, and the adjacent uh, Centro de Astrobiología. Now he is an uh, ALMA Fellow in Santiago, Chile, since uh, November 2020, and uh, he will talk about this uh, new result in his uh, research. So thank you very much, Miguel, for being here, for accepting this invitation to give the talk, and the floor is yours. Oh, thank you very much for having me here for the introduction. So, yeah, so today I'm going to tell you about what I've been working on in the last few years, which is mainly intermediate and high mass star formation and their protoplanetary disks and associated planet formation in those disks. So, uh, before starting, uh, let's see if this works. Of course, it doesn't. And on the Sorry. Um, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, before starting, let me give a brief overview of star formation for those of you who are less familiar out with the topic. So, as you know, star formation happens in molecular clouds that look somewhat like that, which are regions of cold gas and dust. And here you have a simulation of a molecular cloud evolving through time. And as you can see very quickly, like as soon as we start a simulation in a few hundred thousand years, we already have a structure. And that structure is very going to very quickly converge to filaments, which are going to very quickly get over densities, which is going to trigger a star formation very inefficiently. But you can see newly formed stars uh, popping all over the place. And uh, now in this, it's a bit I have to come here. Okay. In this sketch, artistic impression, um, you can see the typical sequence that we use to explain the star formation process. So as I said, we start with molecular clouds uh, in which we have these cores that form and those cores start contracting because of their own gravity. And as they contract, they heat up and radiate. And at some point, 10,000 to 100,000 years after the collapse began, we already have a disk that has formed because of conservation of angular momentum. But these objects are still quite chaotic and energetic. They are very embedded into the surrounding material. Uh, they have very strong outflows in the form of jets and winds. And as you can see in the SED, they might be visible in the optical, but most of the energy is being emitted in the infrared or at longer wavelengths. But then 100,000 years to a million years after the collapse began, uh, we get to what we call the premium sequence phase or class two objects in which at a much smaller length scale, we get a well-defined protoplanetary disk or accretion disk that's moving material inwards and accreting it onto the forming star. And these objects are not that embedded into their surrounding material. They might have outflows, but they're not that energetic. And as you see in the SED, they're already picking in the optical, but we still have a significant amount of infrared excess that's coming from the disk that's radiating in the infrared. And then, well, as time goes by, the disk dissipates, uh, material is either accreted or rejected or locked into the planets that are being formed this disk. And at some point, a million to 10 million years after the collapse began, we end up with a fully formed star with a planetary system around that should not be very different to our own solar system in theory. So, uh, in this talk, I will be only talking about the latest stages of star formation. So I will be only talking about these late stages that we call the premium sequence phase. So I will not be discussing uh, 
the, the stages that are not optically visible, not very optically visible. Uh, I have to say that this whole picture is the one that applies for low mass star formation. For high mass star formation, we don't really know how this picture looks like. They kind of skip through the premium sequence phase. So high mass forming star look more like this, but uh, it's not very clear still. And of course it's assuming singular stars and non-binaries and everything. So the picture can get more complicated. Let's not enter there. So uh, we study premium sequence stars and we can actually observe them using a variety of techniques. For example, ALMA, this is millimeter wavelength observations of uh, different um, premium sequence objects of different masses. And you can see that we can see their disk, we can study them and we can see the structure within those disks. We see that most of the disks that we target with an average solution have a structure. And in most cases, we believe that that structure is due to um, ongoing planet formation in those systems. So that's a brief overview of star formation. And now uh, just to make sure that we're on the same page, let me state what I mean by intermediate and high mass uh, premium sequence stars. And um, in general, I will be calling intermediate and high mass premium sequence stars, all those forming stars that are above 1.5 solar masses, which is the typical boundary with the T Tauri regime. So here I'm showing you a Hesper Russell diagram. So this is stellar luminosity versus effective temperature. Um, these are all the intermediate and high mass premium sequence stars that have been historically known. And for the sake of simplicity, I'll tend to call them Herbig stars in general during this talk. Because historically, most of the objects in this group belong to the Herbig AEBE group. So uh, Herbig stars are interesting uh, for many reasons, mainly because they have a high impact on the interstellar medium and nearby star forming regions. But they are also interesting because we don't know that much about them. And one of the reasons for that is that we don't know that many Herbig stars. And you might think that 250 is quite a large number. But in contrast, we know thousands of Titori stars, which are on average a thousand times closer. So uh, to illustrate why these objects are interesting, let me show you a few um, open problems. For example, clustering. We know since the late 90s that the more massive stars tend to form in clusters, but we still don't know what has to happen for a massive star to form relatively isolated. Uh, regarding this structure and evolution, we know that the protoplanetary disks around Herbig stars are different than those around the lower mass counterparts. In particular, we know that they are more massive and they have a higher fraction of structures. Moreover, they have a higher incidence of, of particular structures like spirals, but we think they are, they are caused by uh, gravitational instabilities in these very massive disks. And for those reasons, uh, it has been theorized that these intermediate and high mass forming stars have a higher incidence of giant planet formation. So they are ideal targets to study uh, giant planet formation mechanisms. Um, well, I should say that that's true up to three solar masses when the host star is beyond three solar masses, probably uh, like the photo ionizing radiation and the radiation pressure is too large. It generates a hostile environment that's probably not very, not very nice for planet formation, but we don't really know because we haven't targeted many of those disks. But the sweet spot for giant planet formation is probably between 1.5 to 3 solar masses. And to further illustrate that Herbig stars are important for planet formation, I have to bring the case of AB Oriage, which is a Herbig star in which disk a protoplanet has been recently discovered. And that's important because we don't know that many protoplanets. I think we know around over 5,000 exoplanets, but we only have a handful of protoplanets, like forming planets that we detect while forming uh, candidates. Actually, this is one case, and the only other confirmed detection, of course, is the case of PDS 70, um, which is a Titori star, but in which uh, a few protoplanets have been discovered. And this is an ALMA image, and we've been even able to see a circumplanetary disk or like an, an accretion disk around a planet that might lead to, uh, might or might not lead to formation of exomoons. So with this, I want to illustrate why Herbigs, despite being much lower in number because of the initial mass function than Titori stars are quite important for, uh, for studying planet formation mechanisms. <clears throat> 
And um, of course, the fact that we struggle so much to find protoplanets raised the question if we're seeing planet forming or planet hosting disks. It seems likely that we are seeing uh, well, the planets formed at the earlier, way earlier stages of the star formation. And what we're seeing is the leftovers of a planet formation that already happened. So we, it, that's why it's so complicated to find um, uh, forming planets interacting with the disk. Um, another open problem is how these objects accrete material, how the disk transfer material to the forming star. Here I'm showing you a, an artistic impression of a low mass uh, forming star. Um, you can see the disk, there's a lot of things going on in the disk and I don't want to enter into details. Uh, there's material going in, material going out, um, uh, dust grains settling down and complex chemi chemistry going on top of the dust grains. But the key thing here is that this is a disk of gas and dust and the dust sublimates at a certain distance from the, from the star and only a disk of gas which is closer to the star. And now, because low mass stars have a strong magnetic fields or strong enough magnetic fields, they are able to truncate the disk of gas and then the material is secreted through the magnetic field lines onto the star. And we call that magnetospheric accretion and it's well settled that that's how uh, low mass stars accrete. And I like this plot to show the relative size of the, of the whole thing because the, uh, the, the accretion happens within a few stellar radii, but then the disk can extend to hundreds of astronomical units. However, uh, we don't really know how high my stars accrete. So as I said, this is another um, illustration. This is the magnetospheric accretion applying for low mass uh, premium sequence objects. Again, we see the material being accreted through the magnetic field lines, but the higher mass premium sequence objects, we know that they cannot accrete that way because they don't have magnetic fields strong enough to support that mechanism. And that's mainly because um, they're mostly radiative. They don't have uh, uh, the large convective layers that uh, the lower mass objects have that sustain these magnetic fields. But we don't really know how they accrete. There is no model or robust theory to explain how, how most of them accrete. So we look at all those problems and we thought, well, wouldn't it be great to have a large homogeneous sample of newly identified intermediate and high mass premium sequence stars that we can obtain from the surveys that we already have. So we decided to do that. We decided to look for new Herbig stars. Uh, in order to do so, we look for the main observational characteristics of of these objects, which are infrared excess coming from the disk. Well, emission lines, I'll focus on H alpha emission, which is uh, tracing the hot gas close to the star, and photometric variability, which is mainly caused by material in the line of sight. And we decided to use machine learning techniques for that, in particular, we use artificial neural networks. And in order to trace all those characteristics, um, well, yeah, I should say that this is has been done quite often recently for lower mass objects with relative success, but it has been proven harder to do or more tricky to do um, for the more massive objects, which are much lower in number. Um, but yet these techniques are not new. And in order to trace this, those characteristics, we've used a bunch of surveys from very different telescopes in order to trace the um, H alpha line, we use uh, the IFAS and IFAS plus surveys, which are two H alpha surveys in the northern and southern hemisphere, respectively. Uh, in order to trace the near infrared excess, we use two mass. The mid infrared excess, we use Ys, it goes up to 22 micron. And um, in order to trace the optical photometry, we use Gaia, which also allow us to study the, the uh, photometric variability of the sources. So we use all that information, we put it into the machine learning check. Um, uh, I'm not going to give you much, much details about this, but um, as you know, artificial neural networks, this is supervised learning. So uh, it's, the algorithm needs to be trained with known label data, a group of objects that we control and, and we believe in them. So we need to select that training set. As I've shown you before, we have a group of Herbics that, uh, that's kind of well studied. We need to select the characteristics. We select what we want to classify. 
a lot of work goes into deciding what's the best algorithm and what's the best hyperparameters that we want to use for this particular problem. Uh, this is actually most of the work. And at some point, we end up with an artificial ne neural network, which is trained and is able to generalize. Um, it can be applied to all the sources that have the information we've used. And um, the result was um, a large sample of uh, principal candidates that I'm showing you here in a color magnitude diagram. And from this sample, we were able to further select um, a sample of around 2,200 new Herbig stars. And, and if you think that before we knew 250 objects of the class, well, this is uh, one order of magnitude increment in the, in the number of known intermediate to high mass forming stars. And I want to say that all these 2,200 Herbig stars will be observed by WIF. Uh, WIF is a new multi-object spectrograph and integral fit unit that was just placed at the 4.2 meter William Herschel telescope in La Palma. And uh, well, we will do several surveys, including one from John Star Objects, and it will observe all these, all these stars. So we're very excited for that. I think the first light is about to happen very soon. It was delayed because of pandemic, and then it was delayed because of the volcano. So hopefully now there won't be any more um, apocalyptic events uh, happening. Um, so this was the main result that we published in 2020. Uh, but now you can say, well, you know, machine learning is tricky. Uh, do we know the accuracy of this uh, sample? Do we know well, how good it is, how, how many contaminants it has? So in order to assess that, we decided to do a spectroscopic survey of a subsample of 145 of those uh, Herbie candidates in three different telescopes, the INT in La Palma, the 2.2 meters in Caralto here in Almeria, and the new technology telescope in La Silla. Uh, as I said, we observe 145 of these Herbie candidates. Uh, this is example spectra that we took for a source with a very catchy name. And um, yeah, I should say that most of these objects have no prior observations at all. So we really didn't know anything except the photometry that we used to identify them. So we took a spectra in a bluish range from 4,000 to 5,000 Armstrong because this range is really good for spectral typing and determining um, sterile parameters of these objects that we really need to classify for the first time. And uh, we also saw the H alpha line because it's a very nice uh, tracer of stellar activity in, in joint star objects. And the results of the survey were that of the 145 objects that we observed, um, 128, uh, we concluded that there were indeed newly confirmed identifications of intermediate and high mass forming stars, which means that uh, the contamination is quite low. We only found eight evolved stars uh, among the sample. So the contamination between five to 8%. So we're quite happy with that in the machine learning. And we also found 55 new uh, premium sequence objects above four solar masses. And those will be very interesting for follow-up observations because we don't know that many optically visible massive forming stars. And uh, yeah, before proceeding to the science that we did, I wanted to show you where these objects are. So here, um, I'm showing you, uh, so the right panels are zooming versions of the left panels. This is galactic longitudes versus distance in the radial axis. This is galactic coordinates. So this plot goes up to 5.5 kiloparsec. And this is a zooming version up to one kiloparsec. And the red crosses are the previously known Herbigs and the blue dots are the new identified sources. And I want to show you this because a lot of people, well, of the people that work in nearby star forming region get surprised of how far these objects are. Of course, most of the new objects we, are, we identified are farther away than the previously known ones. As it makes sense because most massive stars nearby were already known. Um, but and the point I want to make here is that for many uh, topics, it's quite interesting and definitely worth it to move to outer regions or to start populating uh, regions that are farther away uh, in order to understand that. Because for example, uh, regarding planet formation, most of the exoplanets that we know about um, were not formed in regions like Taurus of Lupus, but in regions with a significant amount of massive star formation like Carina can be, for example. 
So what science did we do with this sample? Well, one of the things I can show is that because we have measured the age alpha line, and if we uh, believe or we accept that most likely the age alpha line is stressing the, stress the accretion columns or the accretion phase of these subjects, we can use the age alpha line equivalent width to estimate the mass accretion rates. And that's why I'm showing you here. This is mass accretion rates versus stellar mass. And what we found is something that was already observed for the previously known objects, is that the lower mass uh, premium sequence objects, they accrete similarly for the same gradient. And actually we could put here all the tutorial stars, so this extends to the lower mass regime. But there is a point at around four solar masses where there is a change in accretion radiant, and it will seem that the more massive stars accrete differently. And uh, that's what we believe that we're seeing. Uh, we think that what we're observing there is this transition from a magnetospheric accretion to an accretion mechanism that has a direct contact phase between the gas disk and the, and the star, some kind of boundary layer accretion. And we have dedicated quite some effort in the past to characterize this, um, this gas phase within the dust sublimation radii uh, using different techniques, spectroscopy, photometry, and optical interferometry. Um, without giving details, I will say that in general, most of the results point in this direction that we're indeed seeing a change in, in accretion mechanism for these objects. Um, uh, we've also been trying to understand the relationships between the accretion phase and the ejection phase because a lot of these objects have strong winds and that proof kind of challenging. But in general, we are reassured that what we're tracing is, is, is the, 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 the gas being accreted onto the star. And um, yeah, with this slide, I want to exemplify why is it important to make this large new homogeneous surface with, a, with many new objects. And that why it's important to, uh, to have new populations of kinds of stars that are not very well studied. Uh, for example, this is HD152384, of which we published about last year. And uh, this is a Herbig star, forming a star 2.1 solar masses. And we realized that it's very close to the main sequence. So it's at the very latest stages of star formation. And it has a disk, but the disk is rich in refractory elements, but it's entirely depleted of volatile. So it has not a single hint of uh, hydrogen emission. And uh, uh, we think that this is unique within the group of young stars, or at least the first time this is uh, reported. And uh, what we speculate that this might be is that this disk is not um, primordial, it's not coming from the, um, the original process of star formation, but uh, is due to the collisions between rocky planets in a newly formed exoplanetary system. And another example of why it's important to do this, um, uh, this large, uh, construct these large homogeneous samples is uh, that we've been founding a population of hybrid disk that we were not seeing before. And by hybrid, I mean that we know a lot of protoplanetary disks, this very massive disk with a lot of gas and dust that I've been showing you so far. And we also know a lot of debris disks, disks that barely have gas, might have some secondary gas, primary is not very clear, but they barely have gas and they have very little dust. But we don't really know much about the picture in between. Actually, in this plot, this is uh, infrared excess as 12 micron versus H. And there were only two objects that we knew beforehand that were between these two evolutionary phases, one of them being the very famous beta peak system. And now with this new surface, we've been able to start populating and studying um, that transition phase between those two uh, evolutionary stages. And uh, yeah, the last science I can mention that we're doing is to study the effect of the environment on these uh, intermediate and high mass uh, forming stars and to study the effect of the environment, um, Gaia astrometry is a very powerful tool, in particular when combined with um, uh, machine learning techniques. We're using a supervised machine learning code, HDB scan. And what we're doing is to take all these big sample of intermediate and high mass uh, forming stars and study how relatively clustered or isolated they are and see how the environment affects their accretion rate and disk evolution. And 
to some extent how they can affect their environment. So um, this is work in progress. Um, and it's being done by a master student of mine in Santiago, Manuel Cavieres at the uh, Universidad Católica of Chile. And what we are finding is that at, it was previously known, the more massive stars tend to appear more in clustered, but we have a very significant fraction of stars that appear to be quite isolated. I don't, and we don't really understand why, especially between four and six uh, solar masses. Um, but there are still, many things that we have to add to this picture to uh, have a more uh, general view of the environmental effects of these objects. And these are, uh, for example, uh, flybys. We know now that 20 to 30 percent of all premier sequence stars experience uh, significant flybys at some point of their evolution. This is a stars that, that uh, move close enough to affect their disk and hence their accretion rate. And that's something that no one has been really paying attention until a few years. And it's something that we can estimate with Gaia, at least statistically for some objects. Binarity, I haven't mentioned binarity so far in the talk. <laughs> of course, binarity is very important for star formation and, and disk evolution, um, especially for the more massive stars. Uh, for example, in that paper of Panic et al. last year, we studied the Herbig binary system, and we noticed that the mutual photo evaporation and this truncation really affects the uh, evolution of the gas disk and of the dust disk. So um, it's not very clear how binary evolution in massive premier sequence stars develops, but it's something that we can attempt to trace with Gaia 2 using the astrometric uh, irregularities to detect binaries. And of course, we're also dedicating a lot of efforts to this dispersal time scales and to see how different populations in different regions exposed to different uh, environments uh, have, might have different this dispersal time scale. And in that paper of Mendigutia et al, 2022, that was just accepted, we've been studying if the this dispersal time scale in the outskirts of clusters is different than in the interior of clusters, where it's typically more density of stars and more density of massive stars. And um, the last project I want to mention is uh, this uh, ongoing Exhutter service that we have, in which, um, well, as you know, Exhutter is a mid resolution um, spectrograph of the VLT that goes from the near ultraviolet to the uh, near infrared, more or less. So it's a very wide coverage. And uh, we're targeting 150 of these Herbig stars. And the idea is that we have selected a very representative population from very early ages, from like one million year up to the main sequence. And this will allow us to study how the um, accretion mechanism of these objects evolve uh, with time. And we selected a mass range of 1.5 to 3 solar masses because 1.5 is typically with all the T-Tori service stored. So we can um, complement the T-Tori service at the, um, at the high mass end up to three solar masses, which is the point where we really stop understanding what we're seeing with the emission lines and how the, the objects are created, et cetera. So this survey will extend the, um, the current ongoing service in the Tory regime, and it will be complemented with arm observation of these disks. So we will be able to also see how the disk evolves towards the main sequence. And if we can say something about, um, about their planet forming mechanisms. So, uh, conclusions. Uh, we have proposed 128 new Herbig stars. This is uh, premium sequence stars that are more massive than 1.5 solar masses. And we are being able to characterize them in detail, drive extinctions and stellar parameters for all of them. Uh, this increases the number of known objects of the class by around 50%. And not only that, but it's also, they are sustained uh, more unbiased way. Uh, we've been able to drive accretion rates for 104 of those. And we see this change in accretion rating at four solar masses that we think indicates that the more massive stars or most of the more massive stars accrete differently. And the wishful thinking part of the conclusions, um, these observations are just 6% of the big catalog that we published in 2020. The whole catalog will be observed eventually with width. 
Um, and we are already have quite a battery of full observations uh, with X shooter to study the evolution of accretion and uh, several other parallel studies on their clustering properties and on the study of their disks from a sub millimeter perspective and also from a, a scattered light perspective with instruments like a sphere, for example. So yeah, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Miguel, for uh, this talk. And now the talk is open for questions. So for the participants in Zoom, please raise your hand. And if there are any questions in the room, please, uh, Miguel, uh, approach to them. Questions? There is one here. Should I pass the mic? Yeah, please. Hmm. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, Really amazing results, and I'm looking forward to see what other sources will tell us about this whole picture. I was just wondering recently, in, uh, there has been some papers published in archive uh, talking about the IMF and its dependency with the temperature. So I'm just wondering if you have considered um, thinking about these results to consider models of star formation and then varying the temperature of the molecular clouds in order to see how much of the properties that we are seeing in this sample vary from the expected behavior because of that temperature? Um, yeah. Um, no, to be honest, the only thing that we've done in that regard is to see how complete we are according to initial mass function. So in any given volume, if we see this many t tories of this mass, how many more mass stars should we find? And, um, and now we think we're kind of complete. Before we were missing a lot of F type, early type massive stars that we've been avoiding. Um, but regarding that level of detail for how is live variation in mass function, no, we've been using typical Salpeter standard. Um, I mean, it, it, it is hard. The level of precision you can get for estimating the mass of these objects is probably won't allow you to, I mean, especially for the ones that are more massive and then more farther away and oh, most of the uncertainty relies on the parallax determination and then everything propagates and then they might be eight solar masses plus or minus three or four. <laughs> uh, so regarding the, the accretion mechanism, so I didn't know about that, but about the magnetic field lines and everything. So how, how do they know that this is actually how it works <laughs> observationally like so yeah there was a lot of a group of many people working in the late 90s about that um so let me go back to the uh so i don't know how they came up with this idea to be honest it's quite it's quite clever um but the thing is that this so the material gets accelerated quite a lot and then it chokes the surface with great energy. And then it emits some X-rays that get reabsorbed and then they re-emit in the ultraviolet. And that ultraviolet emission, we can see it above the Balmer excess in the spectra. And we can also see it in the form of veiling in the lines. So the lines are a bit more filled than they should. And uh, that has been modeled uh, to a great level of precision, assuming this mechanism. So we see that UV excess and then some people did the equations, assuming that this was happening, and they were perfectly able to recreate the UV excess. Um, but here, we don't have it. I mean, of course, it is, well, most people think, at least I think, that uh, the competing at the mice, uh, 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 have this? yeah, at the high mass uh, end, we just have a direct this to star accretion, but we have no models, no equations for this. So it's very hard to reproduce what we observe. And also these objects have a lot of winds and jets and it's, everything gets messy in there. So it's, it's, hard, it's hard to understand the observables that we're seeing and match them to an accretion model. Any other question for the participants in Zoom? Thanks, Mario. Uh, 
I maybe you mentioned it probably, but uh, like, how did you select this sub sample of like 140 something? So, of course, we try to not bias ourselves to the best candidates because otherwise we could not make the point that the whole catalog was good. But um, to be honest, this is obvious, most of them are quite faint. Like the, 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 like the mean of the sample is around 15 magnitude, 14, 15 magnitude. And we are using well, relatively smaller telescopes. So at the end, we observe kind of the bright end of the, of the sample. That was the main, the main bias. We should not be a bias per se because they were not selected based on their brightness. So the machine learning doesn't know anything about brightness. It's all color-based. Um, but yeah, we just basically observe the, the bright end in an unbiased way. Uh, one day, yes, yes. If uh, if WIF works, yes, it should happen. Hopefully, with Alma too, one day. A, a question from a complete ignorant on star formation and all that stuff. Can you explain a bit more your hypothesis for the formation of that star that you said that they were had no volatiles but a lot of uh, heavy elements? So if I understood well, is not should be not a primordial disk, but something yes. like so. So, um, okay. So uh, we we have observed several disks in which um, we see that the, the gas they contain doesn't come from the original star formation. It's not that gas that was moving in and being accreted, but it has a secondary origin, and that's probably come from comets collision between bodies of different sizes, uh, et cetera. So um, that has been observed on several days, and it's actually quite of a debate when we observe debris with gas, if the gas is primordial, the gas is secondary, and what that, what that does tell us about, um, about planetary system formation. So in this case, I think they got the inspiration because they've seen a very similar thing in some white dwarfs that have uh, planets around and then the white dwarf has a tidal disruption and basically shreds the planet. So there was, there were a few papers, I, I'm sorry, I don't forget the, the exact reference, but uh, recently, in which they also white dwarfs that have the same thing. They seem to have a disk and they were very rich in refractory elements, but have no volatiles at all. And, and that's very strange for a primary origin because there should be hydrogen emission somehow. And, and those white dwarf papers that proposed precisely that, that there was a planet that the white dwarf shared totally. So in this case, this is not a white dwarf, this is a forming star, but um, the, the idea was similar. If we see uh, no volatiles at all in the disk, um, this is a very small disk, by the way, I should have said that. The disk is like 0.3 astronomical units. So it's a very tiny disk close to the star, very dim with no volatiles and some refractories that you can see is, they are not crazy either, but they are there. So the, the theory that we put forward is that we also see some rocky planets that clash and created this small debris disk with some gas. And to complete the question, another thing is how that gas generates from collision between rocky planets. And then there are different theories too. But that's, uh, <laughs> It's different, but uh, well, you can imagine that some gas, you know. So. Okay, there is uh, no questions in Zoom, neither in YouTube. So, if there are no more questions on the room, uh, we can close the talk. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, we have one question here. Sorry. Okay, go on. Go on. Okay, so it was a very nice talk indeed. Um, I guess working in a totally different field, but I had just a, a question about uh, the prevalence of uh, bi binary of, or multiple systems in these Arabic uh, objects. Do you have an estimation of the, the number of objects which uh, are expected to be binary systems? And also in which way does this affect to the star formation and to uh, observations indeed? So. Yeah, that's a big question that we like to put until the perfect. Uh, yes, Herbig's of the of the most, Studied one within the, the binary fraction is around 60% around that. But there are several bias in the way we detect binaries. Most of the techniques we have are either for very close in binaries or for very distant binaries. So we have a gap in binaries that might be at uh, 200 to 500 or 200 to 1,000 AU that we don't really trace efficiently 
especially if the mass difference is high. So um, as I said, it's not very well defined how uh, binaries evolve in these forming stars. I believe on what we're more uh, looking forward to is that probably most of these binary stars are very distant binaries and then they start getting together. And that's why in main sequence stars, we see that most B type stars are binaries. All right. all, for sure, almost all O type stars are binaries. Um, so probably the binary fraction increases with time as these objects get to the main sequence. Uh, and yeah, as you said, the binary impact on the disk and accretion is huge. So most of these models that we do, assuming that they're single stars, should be probably. How about the, the two different accretion mechanisms that you propose? I mean, the, the, the surface contact. So in, in that case, how do you release the angular momentum in that situation? Because you have to release the angular momentum from the disk somehow, otherwise, you cannot continue to, with accretion. So, what's the physical mechanism for releasing angular momentum there? Um, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> You're, you're, you're right that that's one of the main things that we don't really understand is the, you know, the, the difference in velocities between the contact phase and the star are not very well characterized at all. And then we don't know how's the evolution of the disk, um, if it is viscously evolving or is turbulent driven. Or, so there, there are several theories about how can you lose angular momentum via magnetohydrodynamical winds, for example, you can spell out of angular momentum, but at those distances, uh, we, we, we don't know. Any other question? Okay, three. Not here. Not here. So we can close the talk. Thank you very much, Miguel, for this talk. And uh, as I understand, you, you will stay at the IAA for a while. Can you tell us? Uh... Uh, no, I'm leaving tonight, I'm afraid. Okay, okay, okay. So, but, but I'm I'm happy if you invite me again. Okay, <laughs> fine. <laughs> Thank you very much, Miguel. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.